Hello, and welcome to Budo, your program about martial arts and the path of the warrior. Every month you will find the elite of the martial world. Interviews, permanent sections with technical contents, training tips, history of our arts, their forms, their evolution, their secrets. All this will be run by the best masters of the international scene, now and ever. Our goal is to teach while enjoying the endless possibilities of a vast and rich world where cultures, ancient traditions, mysteries, and passion for knowledge merge. A path of power, wisdom, and personal growth which has existed since the man is man. We will be following in the footsteps of that shaman, that primitive warrior who knew the mysteries of nature and the human, capable of creating pain and healing it. We will go after the masters of the arts who are also masters of life. After those who have learned with great effort the keys governing aggressiveness, our most basic instinct to dominate it rather than letting us dominate by them. That path of the conscious, powerful, and courageous warrior, which we all aspire to achieve through the multiple martial paths, forms, and styles, is what we will explore in this journey of knowledge that we are starting today and that we sincerely hope will be to your liking. Today, in our interview with the Master, we will talk with Larry Tatum, a pupil of the legendary creator of American Kempo, Master Ed Parker. Master Tatum is a man of many talents, which include film, music, or teaching of martial arts. Tatum runs one of the most important international associations of Kempo from California, and he frequently traveled around the world teaching his system. He has recently played his own master in a film about Elvis's bodyguard, who, as the fans will know, was a Kempo practitioner. You already end a movie that is now being distributed in many countries. Can you tell us something about it? The title of the movie is Protecting the King, and it's the true story about Elvis Presley and his half-brother, younger half-brother, David Stanley and that when David Stanley was in the ninth grade in high school, he was uh, asked to go on tour with Elvis because uh, he was having some problems in school. So Elvis took him on tour and made him the youngest uh, bodyguard in the history of rock and roll. Uh, the problem was David at, in an, at that age was introduced to uh, everything that is good as well as everything that's bad about going on a rock and roll tour. So in the film, Elvis wants to channel the aggression that's in his half-brother, David Stanley. So he brings him to me, who I play Ed Parker in the film, who was originally my master teacher in Kempo. And he wants me to teach David how to grow, a little bit, grow up a little bit and how to be a good bodyguard with the use of Kempo. And so Elvis comes into the studio with David as I'm taking on six attackers at the same time. It's a very lengthy fight scene in the film. It, uh, it took a lot of effort to get what we wanted down on film. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it a lot. It, it shows the, the real rough rawness of Kempo. Uh, in the film, it's not, I'm not portraying somebody that's on wires or has a green screen behind me, but what you see is what is real, is what's really happening. And uh, Elvis then introduces me to his half-brother, and it goes on into the film how his half-brother goes up a little bit in rank in the studio, and so forth. It's a fascinating movie. It is true. It's a very, uh, a very affecting movie emotionally. Um, it's getting tremendous reviews around the world. It was released about six weeks ago in South America, New Zealand, and uh, now it's in, uh, it has been in Australia, and it's moving into Europe now and then on into the United States. With this, and then step out, step through, and make my shot. You have filmed a video on Kempo sparring. Which are these freestyle techniques? 
Well, in Kempo, when a student comes into the school, the first thing he is taught is self, our self-defense techniques. He's learned how to defend himself and learning the nature of attacks on him. But as he goes along in his training, he learns how to become offensive in his training so that if he has to initiate the, the move in a street situation, he knows how to become aggressively, or what we call aggressive offense. Uh, also, that is the beginnings of learning how to spar or freestyle or kumite, um, to coin a phrase. But when he's learning how to spar, he's learning how to use the principles and the concepts that are in the self-defense techniques, but on a very, very aggressive level. And in this particular DVD, I demonstrate that. Um, I think you'll find it fascinating, and it shows that what you can learn defensively can also be used offensively. See a move, right? Then I move the kick in the range, they grab and punch. How these techniques were created? Well, in, you know, when people come into a school, they, they're learning self-defense, and then, of course, uh, they're going to ask the question, what do I do if I have to initiate the attack? So techniques were devised to teach the student that if their senses or their awareness tells them that they have to move first, that they know how to enact an aggressive technique as opposed to a defensive technique. Crossover, step out, and as I step through, I make my kick. Then I grab and I punch. Why you call them free style? Well, freestyle, freestyle is an American uh, phrase used for sparring or tournament fighting, where you're free within limitations to um, become extemporaneous in your action. That means that whatever you see, you apply the technique at, a, at that moment. It's, you're not uh, restricted to uh, a strict pattern, and that's why we call it freestyle. It's because first, we add the kick and so forth. And then, and what I did this time is the heel palm, I moved the leg and stepped out and then made. Why these techniques are not so taught and well known in Kempo schools? Well, they, and, and they, you know, people like so much to learn the self defense techniques because uh, uh, they are the last zone of contact. You have four zones of contact. Within, within a fight, and that's the last, uh, two of the last zones, actually. But uh, sparring teaches you how to close the gap that exists between you and your opponent. And uh, like I said before, depending upon the nature of your training, if you're going into tournament fighting, okay, then you can't wait for the attack. You have to learn to initiate the attack. Uh, a lot of people just uh, feel comfortable with learning self-defense techniques and they don't want to get involved in sparring, particularly if you're teaching the public, all right? And in my school, I run a number of schools. That means that I have students that are there just to learn self-defense techniques and they're happy with that. But then there are those there that are very uh, tournament oriented and they, they, they're very competitive with each other, so they like to spar, but there has to be a basis from which you learn your sparring. They're, these techniques are basic sparring concepts and principles that you need to learn before you can be good at, at what we call freestyling. In this section, we offer advice from a specialist for self-defense tricks and moves, but not only that, also tactics and strategies to face and respond to the unexpected attacks and escape unhurt from the crossroads. Today, the master of Kyosho Jitsu, the art and study of the vital points of the human body, Sensei Evan Pantazi, will show you how to use these small Achilles heels that we all have to solve some situations of aggression. Next kick we're going to handle is this straight front kick. If you could just bring this kick up toward my stomach for a second, sir. Okay, as the kick comes in, what we want to do is we want to attack the spleen number six. Okay, when you strike the spleen number six, you might not want to strike with your hand because the small bones of the hand or the knuckles can shatter on this big shin bone, especially if he's coming in with a lot of force. If you miss and you hit his heel or your, his, his foot, okay, you can damage your hand as well. 
I like to use the edge of my, my forearm, okay, the uh, radial bone, coming down. Now, the point has to be struck at a 45 degree angle this way for the best results. He's not going to feel the pain until he tries to put his foot down on the floor. When that occurs, when he puts his foot down, what's going to happen is his foot will buckle out. So when I do the technique, I'm not going to do it too hard because I don't want the man to damage his, his own ankle. But when I do that, watch for that foot reaction as I come in. And if you could bring this kick up for a second, sir. Okay, as he comes in with the kick as well, I'm going to attack some points that I didn't point out earlier. There are four gallbladder points right on the lower extremity of the outside of the ankle, right across from the spleen number six point. Okay? These points also must be struck down and in toward the ankle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lightly tap these points to facilitate the nerve, and that's when I'm going to hammer in on the other side with my forearm to catch the spleen six for a better dysfunction. Okay? As the kick comes in slow at first, what I'm going to do is step back and bring it right in, almost like you see in some kata movements. Okay? So as the kick comes in, I'm going to put that. You're going to start to see that he loses his balance and his footing right away. Okay? That wasn't a particularly hard hit. But for that one second that he put his foot down, he lost his balance, lost his control. Bear in mind, he's probably not thinking about trying to reach me right at that moment. He's trying to stop his fall or trying to figure out what just happened to his leg. That gives me the accessibility to get into his head, body points, or whatever I need to do to finish the technique up. Okay? Thank you, sir. Okay. Could you bring the side kick up? As the side kick comes in toward the stomach level, what I'm going to do is attack this gallbladder 34 point. If we remember from the earlier part of the tape, the gallbladder 34 should be come da cut down and in at a 45 degree angle. Again, not using my hand because now I've got soft tissue here buffering, and this is soft tissue here. I want to pinch the nerve against the bone, and I want to try and get in with a penetrating movement with either this knuckle or probably more of the forearm. Okay? I wouldn't use just this bone. I would use the whole back of the hand coming this way because this bone is way too weak to attack on his leg. I might damage my own arm, and I'm not in the fight to damage myself. Okay? Slow motion if you could. So as the kick comes in, I'm going to just drop in on the leg. Now what's going to happen, that will feel the pain. Okay? But it's the other leg that's going to weaken. So watch, come in slow once again, sir. You're going to want to watch that leg over there as, he, as the hit occurs. So as the kick comes in, and I do this, you'll start to see that the legs drop right out from underneath the individual. Each month we will bring to this program some of the most important new books and DVDs in the world and in several languages. This month we will talk about a new front line in the world of Taekwondo, the publication of two books bringing together all forms of this martial art, from the simplest to the most complex. Each of them also has a related video. As a chain of movements and techniques, the forms are the basic catalog of every style. But the forms are much more than that. They are the basic expression of every martial art. In them we can find the rhythms, aesthetics, and optimal models, the character of a style.
The forms allow the training alone and the internalization of the main movements and sequences in lines of power that have a harmonious pace. Formerly, the forms were also the primary way to preserve the technical legacy of a style. Hence, the purity in the performance is so valued in its realization. Once they have been learnt, they allow the martial artist to express his own character, and like a singer, he can version a classic theme, but providing it with his personal feelings. <coughs> This is also true in Taekwondo, which in recent years has recovered and highlighted this point after its success as an Olympic fight competition sport. The creation of world championships has given relevance to this modality, which is undoubtedly the most beautiful expression of a martial art. The pumses we present in this book appear as they should be performed, according to the highest standards within the WTF World Taekwondo Federation. We couldn't have had better advocates for them. Among the performers there are World, Europe and Spain champions, both male and female in all age groups. All of them are part of the technical and Pumses Spanish team. The Spanish team of Taekwondo is among the first in the world thanks to these individualities, but also as a result of a great supportive policy and management, both organizational and technical. There are two books and two videos which have already become a reference in the world scene of WTF Taekwondo. Aikido, literally I, union, Ki, energy, and Do, way or path. That is the path of fusion of the energies. It is a relatively modern martial art founded by Moriye Yoshiba at the beginning of the last century. Aikido is rooted in the Japanese martial tradition and is soaked in its philosophy and concepts of Shinto and Chinese Taoist tradition. <laughs> Oh, my God.
The essence of Aikido is the recognition of the essential unity of all things. One such understanding has taken place in oneself, the warrior becomes unbeatable. When someone attacks me, he is not attacking me, but the universe itself. The tactic principle is based on the idea of, of absorbing the force of the attacker, unifying with it and bringing it to its logical end. The more powerfully you are attacked, the stronger and easier will be the answer. Aikido consists in destroying our own instinct fear or intention to accompany the force which is unleashed against us to its inevitable end, to turn against the aggressor. Usually this is done through some movements which are synchronized with the attacker in order to steal his center and the initiative of action. If you are pushed, not only you don't object, but you will encourage his intention by pulling him until you have emptied his attack, usually turning the force back to the aggressor. These movements are made from a state of mushin, quiet and empty mind. Each answer is not so, but a movement synchronous to the aggressor's movement. There is no cause and effect, just unity. The move reveals the futility of any aggression as a force that always turns against the person who has created it. The performance of these techniques involves the control of breathing as a first step to unify with the attacker. Then the contact with him in order to get his center of movement and redirect it in the absence of our own force just being anchored between heaven and earth, joining the attacker in a dance of forces where one is the yang and the other is the yin, who gives up, absorbs and reorders chaotic tendencies of the aggression, taking them to their logical end. Since the death of its founder, many schools have been created from its core philosophy and technique. Some emphasize a few points, others emphasize other aspects, but all of them explore the wonderful way which was one day opened by the genius Morie Yoshiba. Well, this is all for today. Thank you for your attention. We hope to see you in future programs of Budo, the path of the warrior.